Welcome, everyone, to the first full episode of Comic Corner. In this episode, we're going to kick off the series with a brief history of comics in the United States, providing the background context necessary to understand just how revolutionary the past few decades have truly been. We've got a lot of the ground to cover, so let's not waste any time. Humans have been telling stories through art and pictures since essentially the beginning of our history. Cave paintings like those seen in the Lascaux Cave in France and the Leong Timbuson Cave in Sulawesi, Indonesia, show that art has been part of the human existence for tens of thousands of years. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that our modern comics have evolved from a rich history of communicating through pictures. From ancient Egyptian paintings, to Roman frescoes, to woodcut novels, all telling stories through sequential images. Now, are those comics? Admittedly, they don't look very similar to our modern conception of what comics look like, but the basic structure, using a series of images to convey narrative progression, is still there. It's honestly hard to define which, if any of these examples, count as the first comics, but I'm inclined to say that looking for a concrete answer misses the point entirely. Looking back at history shows that our modern comics are simply the most recent chapter in a legacy of storytelling, that even our current understanding of comics will continue to grow and change. But more on that later. Fast forwarding to the 1800s in the US, we can see the first works that look similar to our modern understanding of comics, usually political cartoons. A cartoon is a single drawing, often with some caption or text to clarify the message. Influential cartoonists would publish these single panel images in newspapers and periodicals, using the images to make statements and critiques of public figures and policies. By the 1860s, satirical and political illustrations have been commonly used for over a century. But Thomas Nast, lauded as the father of the American political cartoon, popularized the practice in American newspapers. In fact, around 1870, Nast led a campaign of cartoons published in Harper's Weekly to remove William M. Tweed, a corrupt New York politician at the time. His cartoons were a success turning voters against Tweed and eventually leading to his imprisonment for fraud, forgery, and larceny. Now, granted, cartoons are not comics. The mediums are undeniably similar, but comics inherently require sequential art, or multiple panels that we read as a narrative. But the evolution from a single panel cartoon to comic strips was a natural gradual transition. Some of the pioneering comic strips from around the turn of the century include Carl Schultz's Foxy Grandpa, and James Spinnerton's Little Jimmy, which typically told short, humorous stories. One of the first comics to expand beyond that comedic genre was Little Nemo in Slumberland, which began in 1905. Little Nemo in Slumberland was a fantasy adventure, following the dreams of a young boy named Nemo, sometimes through several weeks of publication, the first comic strip with a continuing story. From these newspaper comic strips came the creation of comic books, although at the time they were typically just compilations of the newspaper strips, discovering the profit and selling reprints. In 1897, The Yellow Kid in McFadden's Flats became the first comic book, actually boasting the phrase comic book on its back cover. The book was a reprint compilation of Richard Felton Occult's comic strips, starring the title character The Yellow Kid. Similar reprint comic books were published for The Cats and Jammer Kids, Happy Hooligan, and Buster Brown. In 1933, Famous Funnies, A Carnival of Comics was released, one of the first color comic books printed on the now standard size. And then, in 1935, the National Allied Publications, the company that would eventually be DC Comics, published New Fun No. 1, their first comic book and the first comic book with only new original material not just a reprint. Historians typically divide the history of American comic books into ages, eras of trends and practices over the past century. These decades of newspaper findings and comic strips is known as the Platinum Age. The majority of characters created in the Platinum Age have faded into history, with just a few exceptions, like Popeye and Tintin and Little Orphan Annie. Likely, in part, because the Platinum Age comes to an abrupt and decisive end in June 1938. In Action Comics number one, Superman debuted, launching the golden age of comic books. A year later, in May 1939, Batman premiered in Detective Comics number 27, and in October 1939 came Marvel Comics number one from Marvel's predecessor, Timely Publications. By 1941, Captain Marvel, The Flash, Green Lantern, Captain America, and Wonder Woman had all entered the comic world, 
The commercial success and popularity of these heroes drove publishers to want in on the action, and there was a boom of superhero creation. These characters defined the medium in that era, their inexpensive comics and heroic feats appealing to an audience dealing with the Great Depression economic hardship. In the early 1940s, Superman, Batman, and Captain Marvel titles each regularly sold around 1.5 million copies per month. And during World War II, nearly 30% of reading materials sent to deployed troops were comic books. After all, comic book superheroes, with their patriotic American motifs and staunch beliefs in bout justice, made for excellent propaganda. And many of the villains from that era evolved as fictional renditions of real foes, such as Nazi equivalents like the Red Skull or Captain Nazi. During the Golden Age, comic sales were at their peak, with 80 to 100 million comic books purchased in America every month. Comics were truly wide-read. But after the war, both society and pop culture began to change. Although Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman sales remained fairly strong, superheroes fell out of fashion. And through the early 1950s, other genres like crime, romance, western, science fiction, and horror grew increasingly popular. This shift in tone and content, from blind patriotism and heroism to more serious, disillusioned stories, followed the same pattern seen in the sudden popularity of pulp fiction and film noir at the time, broaching grittier, more mature topics. EC Comics is one of the prime examples that came about that post-World War II time, specializing in horror, crime fiction, and dark fantasy. The sudden popularity of more obviously dark and violent storytelling became an easy target for comic critics. Comics had already experienced backlash, particularly from educators and parents who felt the content wasn't real literature and damaged students' literacy. And then, in 1954, psychiatrist Frederick Wertham published Seduction of the Innocent, a treatise on the dangers of youth reading comic books. Burnham, a highly respected and famous psychiatrist at the time, worked at a Harlem hospital and noticed that juvenile delinquents were reading comic books, which prompted him to repeatedly speak out against comics for years. In The Seduction of the Innocent, he concluded that comic books are an invitation to illiteracy, create an atmosphere of cruelty and deceit, stimulate unwholesome fantasies, and suggest criminal or sexually abnormal ideas. He wrote about the perceived gay subtext in Batman and Robin, the overall sexualization of women, and of course, how depicted crime, violence, and drug use were clearly linked to the rising delinquent behavior of the time, essentially teaching children how to be criminals. Today, Verham remains a controversial figure. After his original research was released in 2010, library scientist Carol Tilley found that he manipulated, overstated, and fabricated evidence using misrepresentative examples to make unfounded conclusions. Much like the more recent scare with video games, violent media does not naturally produce violent people. However, if we consider it, some of Verham's critiques, such as the hypersexualization of women and racist depictions of some characters, it echoes critical concerns still relevant in media today. But Verham has become a representative figure of the censorship crusade against comics in part because his work was a catalyst for the already simmering moral panic at the time, sparking an anti-comic campaign. In the wake of his book, newspaper headlines warned of the depravity of comic books. Church and community groups organized to protest and collect offensive comic books. And as early as three years after World War II, Americans were burning comics, burning books. In 1948, in Spencer, West Virginia, 600 children publicly burned comic books, watched on by priests, teachers, and parents. A similar book burning was featured in Time Magazine as residents in Binghamton, New York, held a mass comic book burning, and similar events spread throughout the country as groups like the Cub Scouts and the Girl Scouts mobilized to destroy the obscene content. And on a governmental level, more than 100 acts of legislation were introduced to ban or limit comic sales, including a New York law that prohibited publication of lurid comics and restricted sales to children under the age of 18. In response to Vertem's book and the public outcry, the U.S. Senate Subcommittee to Investigate Juvenile Delinquency put comics on trial. The hearings were televised, calling people to testify on the comic book industry, including Vertem himself. No legislation came directly from that hearing, but the impact is undeniable. Fifteen publishers went out of business the summer after the hearings, and EC Comics, who had been one of the main targets in the hearing, only survived by converting their mad comic book to a magazine.
And as a preemptive strike later that year, the Comic Magazine Association of America adopted the Comics Code Authority, or the CCA, a censorship code to sterilize comic books. To name a few tenets, it required that depicted crimes couldn't create sympathy for the criminals, that police and government officials couldn't be depicted in a way that creates disrespect, that scenes of excessive violence or profanity were forbidden, that good must triumph over evil, and that any suggestive illustration or sex perversion was forbidden. The code even banned the use of the word horror or terror in comic titles. That industry self-censorship is a familiar story, a disturbing echo of what happened in the film industry only a couple decades earlier with the Motion Picture Production Code. It was the same cycle then, too, where society's moral panic drives the industry to censor its material in order to protect itself from governmental influence. Over the years, the Comics Code Authority went through a couple revisions, the first of which, in 1971, relaxed restrictions on crime comics, discussed how to include drug use, lifted the horror ban, and liberalized standards of sexual representation. And then, the dawn of the comic book shop and direct market distribution in the late 1970s gave publishers a way to bypass the Comics Code, which led to the Code's second revision in 1989 shifting to a document that served more as a general guideline. But the Comics Code Authority remained for decades, with DC and Archie the last two publishers to drop the seal of approval, only in 2011. The CCA was certainly not the death of comics. In fact, going into the 1960s, the first major comic book conventions began, the Batman television series first aired, and Stan Lee joined Marvel, launching superheroes like the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, and the Hulk. But in David Hajdu's book, The Ten Cent Plague, he chronicles how the code's restrictions, coupled with the commercial rejection of the medium, led to a significant decline in comic work, with the number of titles published dropping from 650 to 250 in just two years. And perhaps the most lasting impact of the code in the industry, the Comics Code Authority restricted what stories the comic medium could tell. Because of the moral panic in the code, the late 50s into the 60s saw another tone shift in comics, this time containing sillier plots and campy jokes, the kind of childish absurdity that still is associated with comics. Just as comics really began to stretch their breadth and capabilities, the code forced comics to be, first and foremost, a medium safe for children. From these circumstances came the birth of modern graphic novels, a form of comics that attempted to shake the stigma of the dime store, mind-polluting comic books. Some say that the first known graphic novel can be traced to the 1783 adaptation of Leonardo und Blondin, a rendition of a German ballad told through captioned copper etchings. And there's a lot of discourse over the origin of the term, who coined it first, and what comic-style works could potentially be considered graphic novels. But the term became popularized by Will Eisner, who described his work, A Contract with God, as a graphic novel. If you're unfamiliar, Eisner was one of the earliest cartoonists, lauded as the Orson Welles of comics, particularly for his groundbreaking work in developing our understanding of visual narratives and comic language. Eisner taught classes on the techniques and skills needed to tell stories through sequential art, and his arguably most famous work, The Spirit, a comic book published as a newspaper insert in the 40s, made full use of the medium in a way few others had, including full-page compositions, noir shadows, and parallel narratives. His work became the foundation for future cartoonists, and in recognition for that work, the Eisner Awards, one of the most prestigious awards in the comic industry, are named in his honor. Eisner's A Contract of God was published in 1978 and revolutionized the medium, proving that comics could tackle serious literary topics. In A Contract of God, Eisner wrote about the struggles of tenement life in New York City, a semi-autobiographical work that drew upon his own experiences and represented life for poor Jewish immigrants in the 1930s. It portrayed the lives of everyday people, realistically depicting the heartbreak and humanity within that Bronx tenement. A Contract of God is technically a collection of short stories, but they come together to craft a singular work, which Eisner pitched to publishers as more than just a comic book and instead as a graphic novel. By definition, a graphic novel is simply enough a novel told through comics and sequential art. But unlike comic strips or comic books, which are essentially installments in a larger series, graphic novels are self-contained and book-length. 
and perhaps most importantly, bear the name novel. By calling the work a novel, Eisner attempted to distance a contract of God from the legacy and stigma of comic books, emphasizing the difference between cheap children's entertainment and the literary value of his work. And while that connotative distinction is important, it's also important because going through a book publisher put a contract of God on shelves in bookstores, not on newsstands or in a comic book shop, but actual bookstores. Now, it's important to note that A Contract of God wasn't wildly successful upon its publication. It was only accepted by a smaller company, Baronet Press, and it wasn't a bestseller, but it had a remarkable impact on the creative community, paving the way for modern graphic novels and inspiring cartoonists from Neil Gaiman to Art Spiegelman to Alan Moore. In the introduction he wrote for the centennial edition of A Contract of God, cartoonist Scott McCloud wrote, a Contract of God transports me to a very specific time in comics history, the late 70s, when the art form of comics felt alive with possibilities to me, but dead as a doornail to Americans in general, a musty, decaying relic of a bygone era. Eisner's book connected with me as a sign of what comics could be. It existed in its own continuum, patiently waiting for the rest of its kind to quietly arrive on the shelves of North American bookstores. From its deliberate artistry, to its serious subject matter, to its prominent claim of being a graphic novel, A Contract of God helped to bridge the gap between comics and books. Since A Contract of God in 1978, there have been a plethora of graphic novels that have made waves in the publishing industry. The Eisner Awards provide a platform for the comic industry to recognize and award the best works of the medium. Then in 1992, Mouse by Art Spiegelman made history by winning the Pulitzer Prize, the first and only graphic novel to win a Pulitzer. Beginning as an underground comic artist, his graphic novel rendition of the Holocaust has become an icon for what serious graphic novels can be, can look like, evidence of how artful the medium can be. Then 2006, American Born Chinese, a graphic novel that tackles racial stereotypes, immigration and identity, and what it means to grow up Chinese American, was nominated for a National Book Award. In 2013, the graphic novel March began telling the autobiographical story of Congressman John Lewis and the Civil Rights Movement. By the third in that trilogy, March won the National Book Award. And just recently, in 2018, Sabrina became the first graphic novel to make the long list of the Man Booker Prize, the UK's most prestigious literary award. More and more graphic novels are not only finding their place on bookshelves, but also standing beside traditional novels, recognized as literature. In Art Spiegelman's words, if you're a cartoonist, you're not ostracized from the club of real artists anymore. But for all that graphic novels continue to stand out, they remain widely undervalued in the critical literary world. Despite Mouse's Pulitzer Prize, there is no category for graphic novels, although there is one for music. Barnes & Noble's graphic novel bestseller lists are only available through their sci-fi and fantasy blog, relegating the entire medium to popular fiction. And in 2009, it seemed like things were changing when the New York Times released bestseller lists for graphic books, announcing the graphic hardcover, softcover, and manga lists in anticipation of the Watchmen movie, boasting that comics finally joined the mainstream. Only to then eliminate the lists eight years later, claiming that the Times was cutting back on the lists to dedicate efforts to expanding coverage. In 2018, literary agents and over 400 other members of the publishing industry signed a petition requesting the return of the lists, especially because that promised expanded coverage never really happened. In the petition, they hit the nail on the head, saying, the bestseller list is not the be all end all of comics publishing, nor is it an indicator of literary quality but it does help with the visibility of our medium, and thus helps advance comics as serious literature. The list plays an indispensable role in helping new readers discover books and making the storytelling that we love more visible in the cultural conversation about literature. Without the list, it's harder for us to sell books, which makes it more challenging for publishers to take chances on new voices. Without those lists and the attention and credibility afforded by a New York Times endorsement, Graphic novels have to work a lot harder to convince readers that they're available and worth reading, fighting amongst all other novels to earn a place on the regular lists. Although it does make it even more impressive when graphic novels like March break through, proving that they can compete. And so, despite the ground gained, comics fight for recognition as a legitimate art medium continues, 
In future episodes, we'll continue seeing how this struggle plays out in an increasingly complex and interconnected media world. We'll also discuss how the industry moved forward into the modern age of comics and what that means for the current state of the comic industry, particularly in how it's been forced to evolve and in their continuing struggle for legitimacy as a medium. But first, next episode, we're going to deviate from this background context and talk for a moment about the rising consciousness of visual literacy, examining what that means, how it relates to the creation of comics, and the growing recognition that it takes skill and knowledge to both consume and make comics.